I picked up the phone and knew immediately it was an unexpected call from you. The speed with which we identify a familiar voice coming out of the blue is comforting, but also somewhat mysterious. Because the measures, the units we use in calculating the clear distinction that exists between one voice and another are unformulated and nameless. They don't have a code. These days more and more is encoded. So I wonder whether there aren't other measures equally uncoded yet precise by which we calculate other givens. For example, the amount of circumstantial freedom existing in a certain situation. The extent and the strict limits of this freedom. Prisoners become experts at this. They develop a particular sensitivity towards liberty not as a principle, but as a granular substance. They spot fragments of liberty almost immediately whenever they occur. On an ordinary day when nothing is happening and the crises announced hourly are the old familiar ones and the politicians are declaring yet again that without them there would be catastrophe, People, as they pass one another, exchange glances. And some of their glances check whether the others are envisaging the same thing when they say to themselves, So, this is life. Often they are envisaging the same thing. And in this primary sharing, there's a kind of solidarity before anything further has been said or discussed. So, I'm searching for words to describe the period of history that we are living through. To say it's unprecedented means very little, because all periods were unprecedented since history was first discovered. And I'm not, no, I'm not searching for a complex definition. There are a number of thinkers such as Zygmunt Bauman who've taken on this essential task. No, no, I'm looking for something more like a figurative image to serve as a landmark. Landmarks don't fully explain themselves, but they offer a reference point that can then be shared. And in this they are like the tacit assumptions often contained in popular proverbs. And without landmarks, there is the great human risk of turning in circles. The landmark I found is that of prison. Nothing less. Across the planet, we are living in a prison. The word we, when printed or pronounced on screens or broadcast, has become suspect, for it's continually used by those with power in the demagogic claim that they are also speaking for those who are denied power. So, let's talk of ourselves as they. They are living in a prison. What kind of prison? How is it constructed? Where is it situated? Or am I only, only using the word as a figure of speech. No, it's not a metaphor. 
the imprisonment is real. But to describe it, one has to think historically. Michel Foucault has graphically shown how the penitentiary was a late 18th, early 19th century invention, closely linked to industrial production, its factories and its utilitarian philosophy. Earlier, earlier, there were jails that were extensions of the cage and the dungeon. What distinguishes the penitentiary is the number of prisoners it can pack in and the fact that all of them are under continuous surveillance thanks to the model of the panopticon as conceived by Jeremy Bentham who introduced the principle of accountancy into ethics. Today, in the era of globalization, the world is dominated by financial, not industrial, capital. And the dogmas defining criminality and the logics of imprisonment have changed radically. Penitentiaries still exist, more and more are being built. But prison walls now serve a different purpose. What constitutes an incarceration area has been transformed. Twenty years ago, Nella Bielski and I wrote a play called The Question of Geography, and it was about the Gulag. In Act Two, a Zek, that's to say a political prisoner, a Zek talks to a boy who has just arrived and talks to him about choice about the limits of what can be chosen in a labour camp. When you drag yourself back after a day's work in the tiger, when you are marched back, half dead with fatigue, half dead with fatigue and with hunger, you are given your ration of soup and bread. About the soup, you have no choice. It has to be eaten whilst it's hot or least while it's warm. About the 400 grams of bread, you have a choice. For instance, you can cut it into three little bits, one to eat now with the soup, one to suck in the mouth before going to sleep in your bunk, and the third to keep until next morning at 10 when you're working in the tiger and the emptiness in your stomach feels like a stone. You empty a wheelbarrow full of rock about pushing the barrel, about that, pushing the barrow to the dump, you have no choice. Now it's empty, you have a choice. You can walk your barrow back just like you did when you came, or, if you're clever, and survival makes you clever, you push it back almost upright. And if you choose the second way, you give your shoulders a rest. The gulag no longer exists. Millions work, however, under conditions that are not very different. What has changed is the forensic logic applied to workers and to criminals. During the Gulag, political prisoners, categorized as criminals, were in fact reduced to slave laborers. Today, millions of brutally exploited workers are being reduced to the status of criminals. 15 million Mexican women and men work in the USA without papers and are consequently illegal, criminal. A concrete wall of 1,200 kilometers and then a virtual wall of 1,800 watchtowers are being planned along the frontier between the USA and Mexico. Okay. 
ways around them, all of them dangerous, will of course be found. But between industrial capitalism, dependent on manufacture and factories, today, financial capitalism, dependent on free market speculation and front office traders, the incarceration area has changed. Speculative financial transactions add up each day to $1,300 billion, 50 times more than the sum of commercial exchanges. 50 times more. The prison is now as large as the planet and its allotted zones vary and they can be called work sites, refugee camp, shopping mall, periphery, office block, favela, suburb. What is essential is that those incarcerated in these zones are fellow prisoners. Today, the purpose of most prison walls, concrete, electronic, patrolled, or interrogatory, different kinds of walls, their purpose is not to keep prisoners in and correct them, but to keep prisoners out and exclude them. Most of the excluded are anonymous, hence the obsession of all security forces with identity. They are also numberless for two reasons. First, because their numbers fluctuate, because every famine, natural disaster and military intervention, now called policing, every one of these either diminishes or increases the multitude. But secondly, because to assess their number is to confront the fact that they constitute most of those living on the surface of the earth. And to acknowledge that is to plummet into absolute absurdity. Those who have legal employment and are not poor, they, they are living in a very reduced space that allows them fewer and fewer choices. Except, of course, the continual binary choice between obedience and disobedience. Their working hours, their place of residence, their past skills and experience, their health, the future of their children, everything outside their function as employees has to take a small second place beside the unforeseeable and vast demands of liquid profit. And furthermore, the rigidity of this house rule is called flexibility. In prison, words get turned upside down. The alarming pressure of high-grade working conditions has recently obliged the courts in Japan to recognize and define a new coroner's category of death by overwork. No other system, the gainfully employed are told again and again, no other system is feasible. There is no alternative. Take the elevator. The elevator is a small cell. Look at the power structure of the surrounding world and how its authority functions. Every tyranny finds and improvises its own set of controls, which is why they are often at first not recognized 
as the vicious controls they are. The market forces dominating the world assert that they are inevitably stronger than any nation-state. And this assertion is corroborated every minute. For an unsolicited telephone call trying to persuade the subscriber to take out private health insurance or a pension, to the latest ultimatum of the World Trade Organization. So as a result, most governments no longer govern. A government no longer steers towards its own chosen destination. The word horizon, with its promise of a hoped-for future, has vanished from political discourse on both right and left. All that remains for debate is how to measure what is there. And opinion polls replace direction and replace desire. Most governments heard instead of steer. In US prisons slang, herders is one of the many words for jailers. In the 18th century, long-term imprisonment was approvingly defined as a punishment of civic death. Three centuries later, governments are imposing by law, force, economic threats and their buzz mass regimes of civic death. Wasn't living under any tyranny in the past a form of imprisonment? No, not in the sense I'm describing. What is being lived today is new because of its relationship with space. Space. And it's here that the thinking of Sigmund Baumann is illuminating. Because he points out that the corporate market forces now running the world are ex-territorial, that's to say, free from territorial constraints, the constraints of locality. They are perpetually remote, anonymous, and thus never have to take account of the territorial, physical consequences of their action. And he quotes Hans Tietmeyer, president of the German Federal Bank. Today's stake is to create conditions favorable to the confidence of investors. The single supreme priority. Favorable to the confidence of investors. Following this, the control of the world's populations, who consist of producers, consumers, and the marginalized poor, is the task allotted to the obedient national governments. The planet is a prison, and the obedient governments, whether of right or left, are the herders. The prison system operates thanks to cyberspace. And cyberspace offers the market a speed of exchange which is almost instantaneous and used across the world today and night, day and night, for trading, trading. And from this speed, the market tyranny gains its ex-territorial license. But such velocity has a pathological effect on its practitioners because it anesthetizes them. No matter what has befallen, business as usual. There is no place for pain in that velocity. Announcements of pain, perhaps, but not the suffering of it. And consequently, the human condition is banished, excluded from those operating the system. They are alone 
because utterly heartless. Earlier, tyrants were pitiless and inaccessible, but they were at the same time neighbours who were subject to pain. This is no longer the case. And therein lies the system's probable weakness. They, that's to say we, are fellow prisoners. That recognition, in whatever tone of voice it may be declared, contains a refusal. Nowhere more than in prison is the future calculated and awaited as something utterly opposed to the present. The incarcerated never accept the present as final. Meanwhile, how to live this present, what conclusions to draw, what decisions to take, how to act. I have a few guidelines to suggest now that the landmark has been established. On this side of the walls, experience is listened to. No experience is considered obsolete. Here, on this side of the walls, survival is respected. And it's a commonplace that survival frequently depends upon solidarity between fellow prisoners. The authorities know this, hence their use of solitary confinement, either through physical isolation or through their buzz, whereby individual lives are isolated from history, isolated from heritage, from the earth, and above all, from a common future. Okay. Ignore, ignore the jailer's talk. Of course there are bad jailers and less bad, and in certain conditions it's useful to note the difference. But what they say, including the less evil ones, is bullshit. They are hymns, they are shibboleths, they are incanted words like security, democracy, identity, civilization, flexibility, productivity, human rights, integration, terrorism, freedom. They are repeated and repeated in order to confuse, divide, distract and sedate all fellow prisoners. On this side of the walls, words spoken by the jailers are meaningless and are no longer useful for thought, not at all. They cut through nothing. So, reject them, even when thinking silently to yourself. But by contrast, prisoners have their own vocabulary with which they think. Many words are kept secret, and many are local, with countless variations. Small words, small phrases, small yet containing a world. I'll show you my way. Sometimes I wonder Something's happening in B-Wing. Stripped. It was stripped. Take this small earring. Yeah, he died for us. Go for it! Go for it! Etc. Etc. Between fellow prisoners, yeah, of course there are conflicts, sometimes violent. All prisoners are deprived. Yet there are degrees of deprivation, and the difference of degree provokes envy. 
On this side of the walls, life is cheap. The very facelessness of the global tyranny encourages hunts to find scapegoats and to find instantly definable enemies among other prisoners. The asphyxiating cells then become a madhouse. A madhouse. And the poor attack the poor. The invaded pillage the invaded. Hmm. Fellow prisoners should not be idealized. But without idealization, simply take note that what they have in common, which is their unnecessary suffering, their endurance, <laughs> their cunning, is more significant, more telling than what separates them. And from this, from this, new forms of solidarity are being born. And the new solidarities start with the mutual recognition of differences and multiplicity. So, this is life. A solidarity not of masses, but of interconnectivity. Far more appropriate to the conditions of a prison. The authorities do their systematic best to keep fellow prisoners misinformed about what is happening elsewhere in the world prison. They do not, in the aggressive sense of the term, indoctrinate. No, indoctrination is reserved for the training of the small elite of traders and managerial and market experts. For the mass prison population, the aim is not to activate them, but to keep them in a state of passive uncertainty. And to remind them, remind them remorselessly that there is nothing in life but risk and that the earth is an unsafe place. This is done with carefully selected information, with misinformation, commentaries, rumours, fictions. And insofar as this operation succeeds, it proposes and maintains a hallucinating paradox for it tricks a prison population into believing that the priority for each one of them is to make arrangements for their own personal protection and to acquire somehow, even though incarcerated, their own particular exemption from the common fate. And this image of mankind, as transmitted through a view of the world, is truly without precedent. Mankind is presented as a coward. Only winners are brave. And in addition, there are no gifts. There are only prizes. But prisoners have always found ways of communicating with one another. And in today's global prison, cyberspace can be used against the interests of those who first installed it. Ah, think about it. And like this, prisoners inform themselves about what the world does each day and they follow suppressed stories from the past and so stand shoulder to shoulder with the dead and in doing so they rediscover little gifts examples of courage a single rose 
in a kitchen where there's not enough to eat. Indelible pains. The indefatigability of mothers. Hmm. Laughter. Mutual aid. Silence. Ever widening resistance. Willing sacrifice. More laughter. Yeah, the messages are brief, but they extend in the solitude of their, that's to say, of our nights. And the final guideline is not tactical, but strategic. Listen. The fact that the world's tyrants are ex-territorial explains the extent of their overseeing power. But it also indicates a coming weakness. They operate in cyberspace and they lodge in guarded condominiums. But they have no knowledge of the surrounding earth. Furthermore, they dismiss such knowledge as superficial, not profound, because for them only extracted resources count. They can't listen to the earth. On the ground they are blind, and in the local they are lost. For fellow prisoners, the opposite is true, because cells have walls that touch each other across the world. Effective acts of sustained resistance will be embedded in the local, near and far. Outback resistance, listening to the earth. Liberty is slowly being found not outside, but in the depths of the prison. <laughs>